My name is Heidi Hernandez. I work for the World Farm Research South America team. Uh, but what I'm presenting here today is part of a project I've developed uh, outside of work uh, in my university back in Peru. Um, they are actually building a computerized tool to assess uh, male fer fertility based on analyzing uh, videos and images from sperm uh, samples. So uh, what I did in the early stages of the project was like a brief research uh, and using Mathematica develop a model to analyze the morphology of the sperm cell head specifically um, as a partial re result on the evaluation of the cell. Um, so this is what I'm going to show you today. Um, first of all, um, the analysis of the sperm cells involves concentration, motility analysis, and morphological classification. Um, there is also a macroscopical analysis that's made to the uh, samples, but I mean, in terms of the mi microscopical analysis, this is what, what uh, usually it's done. Uh, nowadays, the methods used to evaluate sperm mor morphology are mostly manual and lack objectivity. And for the computerized tools that does exist, uh, there is criticism about um, the high cost they have, they are uh, difficult uh, to calibrate, uh, mostly um, they are uh, hard to, ma to use uh, in a lot of cases. So the goal of this project in particular was to develop a computational model to characterize the morphological aspects of the sperm cells and extract features and, classific and the classification of these cells head in normal or abnormal using ma machine learning uh, algorithm. So we use two sources. Um, I use two, two sources. The first of, uh, of those were um, avail made available in the center of digital spermiogram assisted by internet, which is some organization from Chile. Um, I am not including the images in the presentation, but I do have some notes uh, at the end on the reference. So where if you are interested in knowing more about this, you can find the images there. So this is an example of the images we get from the first source. And then from the second source um, was the World Health, Health Organization Laboratory Manual. We get these other images. The, we needed to use two uh, sources because the first one wasn't, didn't contain uh, enough cells. And also, the cells were mostly abnormal, and that doesn't work if you want to build a machine learning model. Uh, you need uh, re re representation for, for both of the classes, normal and abnormal cells. That was the reason we had to use a second source. So for both sources, uh, we had the images, and we also had uh, a classification made by the specialists whether the cells were normal or not, so we could train the machine learning algorithm. So we needed binarized images for these uh, original images so we could analyze the components, in this case, the sperm uh, cells head. So in the case of the first group of images, we, we had uh, those binarized uh, masks for each of the, of the images. So in that case, we were good. Uh, but for the second source, we didn't have those, so we had to do uh, one extra processing to obtain the binarized mask. Um, so Mathematica had uh, tools to do, to do that. Uh, the thing is that they uh, cannot be directly used for, I mean, they, they don't work directly for all of the cases. You need to do some calibration on the parameters. And in this case, for example, this is an example image from the second source. And uh, the binarized function uh, from Mathematica, which is what, what we use, um, what, it, what it does is that it transforms the image to a grayscale and then applies some algorithm, with by default this is the Otsu algorithm, uh, to separate the foreground and the background of the image and re return a binary image which only contains black and white pixels. So uh, internally, the binarized function has have to find a threshold value, uh, but we find out that the value that it's finding by default makes the result something like this, which is not 
what we wanted because there is a lot of information that is not what we need. So the first thing uh, could be to uh, just um, select the components uh, with a select components tool. Uh, in this case, by the area, fi filtering by the, by the area. So we just uh, use the components that have a, a size that we know we are, we are looking for. Um, and we get rid of some white points that are uh, in that space. But that is not enough, again. Uh, so what we did was we, we tried to find an adequate value for the threshold uh, in this case, and we 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 didn't begin from the from zero. We look around uh, the threshold value that Mathematica re returns, and we look in the na neighborhood of the, of that value. Uh, so here, there is an example of what happens if we use a small value of the threshold. We lose information on the cell's head, and if we use a larger value, then we are including information that is not wanted. So the, th the key here was to find uh, an adequate uh, th threshold value. So this is an example of, the, of one of the results obtained. The image is not big, so I'm kind of. So with this pro procedure, we were able to identify almost 98% of the, of the cells in the second source, which for the purposes of the investigation was, of the research was good, a good result. So, the next step is to, is to extract the, the fissure. Uh, Mathematica have the component measurements uh, function, which works with binary images and measure uh, fissures from the from the components in the in the image. Um, so in this case, for example, for the binary image we we have, I've just. I'm just showing what Mathematica does. I mean, it doesn't do that di directly. I just draw the bounding box uh, to see that it's actually uh, identifying in a really good uh, way the head cells, which is what we want. And then, once we are sure that we are ac actually identifying what we want, um, we can measure those, co those components. And I'm showing in, in the data set. Uh, in this case, we are using length, width, area, perimeter, eccentricity, and radio. Something that I didn't mention before is that there is no consensus about what are the fissures that must be used to characterize the sperm uh, head, say, the cell head. Uh, so what we, we did is we used some of the ones that are more mentioned and that have been obtained good results with. Uh, and also we added the eccentricity and the radio just to give the idea that the uh, a sperm cell head must have a round, uh, regular, uh, oval, regular shape. So uh, it, there are some additional steps here. First of all, we need to uh, add a label to each of the of the entities. In this case, the sperm uh, cell head. Um, we needed to add uh, the correct the classification given by the specialists whether the cell was normal or not so we could train the classifier and we also we also needed to convert the pixels of the measurements to to mic micrometers and for that purpose we use a factor for each of the sources with what's given in the documentation of the sources so uh, by doing that uh, we could generate the data for all the images all the cells and at the end we get something uh, we, we get a total of 422 cells, 155 normal, and 275 and, 60, and 67 uh, abnormal. So what we did was converting that to the ma machine learning format for Mathematica, which is the features pointing to the, to the value that of the class. In this case, zero for normal cells, one for abnormal cells. Um, now going to the classification step. Here we use support vector machines. Um, for those who are not fam fam familiar with the algorithm, uh, I'm not going to go deep on that. Just that to mention that that is a, a statistical approach to machine learning because uh, what we do here is that we uh, uh, have a set of features to characterize the entities. In this case, the the sperm's uh, cell head. And, and then we have uh, an algorithm that compute that uh, 
but that build a model, a machine learning model based on that features. So the support vector machines are widely used along bioinformatic applications um, because it, it, and it has high levels of accuracy and applications similar to the one we, we were handling in this project. And it also has a good ability to handle multidimensional data and so on. Um, we did a previous step here b before training the classifier, which was the standardization of data using the standardized function from Mathematica. Um, so we give the same opportunities to all the features, regardless of the num numeric value. And also that uh, reduces the, lo the loss of information due to numeric operations. Um, so we standardize the features and then we did principal component analysis. Why we did this? Um, mostly that's used to re reduce dimensionality of the problems. In this case, that wasn't a, a goal at the beginning because we just have six features, so there was also uh, really no need to re reduce the dimensionality as a computational problem. But the thing is that this uh, uh, also helps the the, mo the data to be in a in a in a feature space, which is more adequate in the sense that. Uh, it shows better the relations be between the features and the class, and we could eliminate re redundant data. Maybe some some features are a combination are, are a combination of, of other features. So, with principal components, we uh, remove that. Um, then there was another question, which was which was how many components to use. Um, I'm not going to go much de de detail of this, but basically what we did was uh, perform several tests with using support vector machines with the default parameters. And, and then we used first one component, then two components, then three components. And, and then we see that uh, with two components, we gain a lot of accuracy in the results, but more than that, it's just not doing things any better. So maybe with three components was a good, good enough decision to make. Uh, in the principal component function of Mathematica, again, um, what it does is that it tra transforms an input matrix in, in its uh, principal component matrix, which have the same, the same dimension, but it have independent uh, columns that are ordered from left to right in order of variances. So if we want the three first principal components, we just grab the first three columns of the matrix, which is what we did here. Um, so for the algorithm, we first have to choose the kernel type. Uh, the most popular kernels for SVMs are linear, polynomial, radial basis function. We did some tests over the training data with default parameters for SVMs, and we obtained that the radial basis function was actually given the best uh, results. And also, I mean, using radial basis function is you, it's generally a good choice in general because um, it handles well nonlinear relations between data. Um, it may behave similarly th that the linear kernel for some para for, for some parameters. So uh, it's generally a good choice. Uh, now, for each kernel type, there are several uh, parameter values to be selected uh, for SVMs. So in the case of uh, the radial basis function kernel which is what, what, what we use, we have to calibrate the penalty factor C and the kernel parameter gamma. Uh, the strategy used here was a grid search, uh, considering different pairs of C and gamma, and then evaluating the, the results. To do this, um, we did two steps. Uh, the first one is a loose grid search in which we use wider intervals, and then we plot the results in here to see what areas um, were the ones where better results were obtained. And then in the second step, fine grid search, uh, we, we went uh, closer to that intervals, and then we choose some values for the parameters. And I have to say here that these values are not magical numbers or anything. Uh, they depend on the data we have for, for training. So if you have a different images data set, so you have to run again this test to find the numbers that fits best the specific problem. Um, then the, we run several tests over the data, separating the data on training and test data randomly. And 
we found that the, we, we obtain a mean accuracy of almost 73%. So to um, get all the things together, um, just have a final example here. Um, once we have uh, doing all the steps, done all the steps, and we have a trainer, trainer um, classifier, which is a classifier function for which we know the parameters that give the best results. Um, we can have an image, um, and then a binary image in this case, and then we can apply the model. What is going to happen behind scenes is that um, this image is going to be measured by component measurements. These measures are going to be uh, converted from pixels to micrometers. Um, they are going to, uh, the, the data is going to be st standardized. Uh, it's going to be principal component analysis and, the, and then the three most important components selected. And finally, using the classifier function that we have generated up here, we are going to classify these cells. And what we are obtaining here is um, well, well, we have it here. <laughs> I'm sorry. I must forgot to evaluate something here. Just one minute. Okay, here we have, and what we get is a data set. Um, this is just to show the result of the model of what we, we were de developing. Um, so we have all the features we've ex extracted from the images, the actual class and the predicted class, and we can mm, see the relation of that with the actual image uh, by enumerating the cells. So we can see that, for example, number eight is normal and was correct break it as normal. That's so it's over here, and so on. So, um, one final thought I want to say here is that I was able to use Mathematica through all the process, uh, from the basic image processing with it to the cl classification part, uh, going through uh, other steps uh, that were com complementary to this work, like standardizing the, the data doing principal component analysis, and so on. Um, by writing minimal amount of code and having everything in the same place. 